I, I'm probably just going to do the introduction today, okay? So if you're thinking we're going to get into the text, um, I like to always explain a bit about the book because I think it's important. In other words, I don't do introduction because it's filler. I do it because it helps you in, in understanding what the writer is saying. And so I always consider it important stuff, and uh, we're going to go through that today, and I hope you'll, you'll uh, stick with me. Now, the book of Hebrews... William Barclay, he remarked just over 50 years ago, he said, when we come to read the letter to the Hebrews, we come to read what is, for the person of today, the most difficult book in the whole New Testament. Now, if you've, if you've gone through Hebrews, if you've worked through Hebrews, uh, you ought to, that ought to resonate, because Hebrews is quite gnarly. <laughs> There's an awful lot of stuff in there that, you know, when you just read it kind of generally, you say, okay, but when you actually read it in some detail... You scratch your head a lot, at least I do. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to go through it, but it, it's, it's a difficult book. Even the background of the book is difficult to determine. George Guthrie, he wrote a commentary in 1998. He's done a lot of work on Hebrews. Here's what Guthrie says. He says, commentators have had to write tentatively concerning issues of background when it comes to this wonderfully complex document. As William L. Lane, Lane wrote a two-volume commentary on the Hebrews from the Word Biblical series of some years back. It says, Hebrews is a delight for the person who enjoys puzzles. The author simply left us little in the way of overt remarks on his own context and the context of his recipients. But so, so it's difficult. The, the, the book itself is difficult. Even the background is difficult to put together. But despite the difficulties, we can make an educated guess about the letter's background. Okay, to quote Guthrie again, he says, like a Sherlock Holmes mystery, clues in the text lead the interested investigator to feasible conclusions. So it's kind of like a detective story. Uh, you go and weigh certain things and you can come up with some, some reasonable conclusions, but you always have to recognize that, you know, uh, we're doing some detective work here. Now, with regard to the recipients, the people to whom the letter is, is being written, it's clear that Hebrews was written initially to a specific group of Christians rather than to the church at large, and that's true of the letters in the New Testament. Okay, They're not somebody sitting here writing saying, I'm just going to write a general letter for the church at large. They are occasional documents. They are written to specific groups of people in specific circumstances and instances. And so what we try to do is you say, okay, I want to hear what the writer of Hebrews or any other letter is saying to the people to whom he originally wrote. So I try to understand the background context. What is he saying to those people? What is God's Spirit saying to them? And then when I hear that correctly, then I'm in a position to say, what is the Spirit saying to us today through what he said to that specific original group of hearers? So that's what we try to do. So it's written to a specific group of Christians, and you can see that from the fact this group administered generously to other Christians in 610, and had endured in earlier days certain specific acts of persecution that are referred to in chapter 10, verse 32 and 34. So you see that it is a localized, specific group of people who had undergone. They have a certain history. The author knows the circumstances under which these people had become Christians. You can see that in chapter 2, verse 3. He knows their present state of mind. You can see that in chapters 5 and 6, and he apparently knows their attitude toward their leaders, which is suggested in chapter 13, verse 17. So we're definitely dealing with a specific group of people. He knows these Christians personally, and he hopes to visit them again. You see that in chapter 13, verses 19 and 23. He requests that they pray for him in 13, 18, and he mentions Timothy's release as an item of news that he believes would be of particular interest to them. So... In terms of the recipients, we're on good, solid ground and saying, okay, this is a specific group of Christians to whom he's writing. Now, this group of Christians is, is being urged in this letter to hold fast to their confession, to maintain their allegiance to Christ. That seems to be, that's what he's writing about. You see that in chapter 3, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 14, chapter 4, verse 14, chapter 10, verse 23, where he says to hold, be steadfast, hold fast, hold fast. Because, you know, they're, they're in need of being encouraged in that regard. And it seems they were being tempted to reject Christianity, to return to some form of Judaism. Okay, which means they were at least largely Christians who had previously identified with Judaism in some way. 
So you have this group, they're, it looks like they're being tempted to return to Judaism, to reject Christianity, to go back there, and he is urging them in this letter, he's urging them to hold fast to their confession. Now no doubt many of these people were ethnic Jews, you know, uh, Jews by birth who had become Christians, but it's also quite possible that a number of them were Gentiles who had become Jewish proselytes, had converted to Judaism, they had some association with Judaism through that, or could even be Gentiles who were God-fearers who had affiliated with the synagogue but who had never converted to Judaism. But in any event, it looks like we have these Christians, they're affiliated, associated, have a background with, or tied in some way to Judaism, and they're being tempted to reject Christ and go back to that. Now, when you think about relevance of a book, you know, we always talk about, well, what's wrong? Why are people leaving? What's going on? Okay, well, this is nothing new. People have been tempted to leave Christ uh, from the first century. Okay, so this is very relevant because we're always concerned about that. When we have people who are drifting away, they're turning their back, they're tempted to go back to the world, we would say, well, they're tempted here to go back to Judaism, but it is abandonment of Christ. And we're always worried in the church about what can we do? We call it closing the back door. Well, let's look at how God's Spirit operates in that circumstance. What kinds of things does He say to people who are in danger of that? What does He say to them? How does He approach the matter? And I think, I think we'll uh, see some eye-opening things here. Now, the fact this letter was known to Clement of Alexandria in A.D. 180 as having been written for Hebrews... As that, that early, we see that, that, that title linked to it. And the fact the earliest manuscript we have of the letter, which dates to A.D. 200, the earliest manuscript we have, it says, to Hebrews or to the Hebrews. Those facts support this idea of who the recipients are, that they are, in fact, in some way, uh, Jews or, or, or associated with Judaism who are going back to it or in danger of going back to it. So that's the recipients. It's a local group of people, a specific group of people, it looks like they are Jews or connected with Judaism who are, who are being pulled back, going back to that, rejecting Christ for some reason, and they're being urged to endure. The purpose of the letter, as I just said, is, that there, is to urge these Christians to hold fast their confession of faith. Now, what was tempting them to revert to Judaism, it's only hinted at. It's not spelled out. You have to go through and try to pull out. And you say, well, why doesn't he spell it out? Because he's writing a letter to a specific group of people. He's not sitting here saying... Let me write a, a document for people here in the year 2000 and whatever this is. Write this out and say, hey, you know, that, that's, he's writing a letter to people. So we have to then go back and, and say, well, what, what is pulling these people? And there are definite clues here in the letter. It seems that what's tempting him is that they're, they're being, they're, at least an aspect of it, is it includes their being tired of bearing the shame of living outside the mainstream of their cultural heritage. And you can see that hinted at in 1313. Okay, there's some sense of, you know, they're tired of this shame of living outside their cultural heritage. There seems to be there a doctrinal blurring of the distinctive place of Jesus. And there's possibly at work a fear of persecution because Judaism was recognized as an official religion by the Romans and Christianity was not. So you could see how that would generate some pressure to identify with Judaism because you had the protection then that this is a state-sanctioned religion. Christianity, on the other hand, was not. And so as a Christian, you are more vulnerable then to pressure from the state. So you can see how these things would pressure someone to want to kind of, hey, you know, I miss this stuff. I miss my life over here. Uh, now, we have different pressures today, but I don't want you to miss the relevance. Okay, that's what we talk about. Well, why are people pulled to things? Well, they're pulled to all kinds of things. But the point is, when they're being pulled, what do we call them to when they're being pulled? Do we say, we'll give you snacks if you come? I mean, is that... Or do we, do we preach the supremacy of Christ? Well, that's what this, you know, the writer here does. And I think there's a lesson in there. Now, now, the theme the writer sounds in warning the readers not to turn from the Christian faith. What does he sound? What's the theme that he sounds? The main theme, it's the unqualified supremacy of Christ. They're, they're in danger of abandoning Christ, of turning back to, to some connection with Judaism, some form of Judaism. And what does he say to them? He preaches the unqualified supremacy of Jesus Christ. This is what Carson, uh, D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo, they write in their, their 
uh, 2005 book, An Introduction to the New Testament. It says, the general theme of Hebrews, the unqualified supremacy of God's Son, Jesus Christ, a supremacy that brooks no challenge, whether from angelic or human beings, is not in dispute. In other words, people who read and study the book, everybody's on board with this. Okay, this is the theme, the dominant thing, the unqualified supremacy of Christ. He says, correlatively, or they say correlatively, the covenant he has inaugurated is superior to any covenant that has preceded it. His priesthood is better than Levi's. The sacrifice he offered is superior to those offered under the Mosaic Code. And in fact, the very purpose of antecedent revelation was to anticipate him and point to him and to all the blessings he has brought with him. See, so this idea, and we have the next slide, he continues here with this quote. This theme of the supremacy of Christ is not the stuff of an abstract essay. Its purpose is repeatedly disclosed by the paranetic passages, the passages of exhortation, the passages that are saying, hey, you need to get on and do this. Okay, repeatedly disclosed by the paranetic passages designed to warn the readers not to turn back from the Christian faith to the forms of piety they once knew. And so that's the, we see this, you have the recipients, the purpose of the letter is, is what I've just said. Now the location of the recipients, where are they? Okay, now many, people, many commentators, ancient and some modern commentators, think the recipients lived in Palestine, perhaps even in Jerusalem. Now they base that conclusion on the, the repeated references to the Jewish cult, the Jewish worship rituals, that you see in the book of Hebrews, these things about the tabernacle and all of that. But several things cut against the conclusion that these hearers, these recipients, are in Palestine or in Jerusalem. First, the letter is written in polished Greek. Okay, and none of the Old Testament quotations or allusions clearly depend on Hebrew or Aramaic. The person writing this goes to the Greek Old Testament. Okay, you know the, the Bible's written, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew with a few sections in Aramaic. Okay, but then it's translated into Greek, and that's called the Septuagint. And this fellow who's writing goes to the Septuagint. There's no indication that he goes to Hebrew, uh, the, those scriptures. Okay, so that's, that's a significant thing. And as Moo and Carson say, they say, from this we must conclude either that the author knew no Semitic tongue, or that his readers, if in Jerusalem, were all expatriates, Greek speakers, choosing to live in Jerusalem or the surrounding area. So it seems kind of odd if you say he's writing to the people in Palestine or even in Jerusalem that he's somebody who's writing in this polished Greek and has no apparent connection to Hebrew. You say, well, it's possible. Maybe he's writing to a group of people who are all Greek speakers who happen to huddle there. Okay, that's possible. But it seems to cut against that conclusion. And then secondly, there were countless Jews outside of Palestine who looked to the cult in Jerusalem. They looked to the temple and all of that for a secure relationship with God and for cleansing so the fact that you have these references to the Jewish worship rituals, to the cult, it doesn't mean that the hearers, the original recipients, needed to be in Jerusalem because those things were quite relevant and central to Jews scattered all out, okay, all over. So the reason for thinking that the readers were in Palestine or Jerusalem doesn't seem terribly strong, and that's why most modern commentators, they think that the recipients live, lived in or near Rome, Okay, and there are three basic arguments or pieces of evidence that lead them to think this. Well, why do you think these, these recipients are in Rome? Well, first, there's that statement in 1324 where it says, those from Italy send you greetings. Okay, now that's an ambiguous statement because it could mean those who have left Italy and are with the writer and are sending greetings back to Italy, or it could refer those to those who are in Italy and are sending greeters from Italy with the writer to those to whom he's writing. Okay, but there's, there's a text in Acts 18.2 where it refers to from Italy, and in that case it's clear that it's those outside who have left Italy who are sending greetings back, or referring you know, to those who are outside of Italy, not necessarily sending greetings, but they're outside of Italy. And so that leads a number of people to say the more likely understanding of 1324 is that it is those who are away from Italy and sending greetings back to Italy. So that's one piece of evidence. The second is that Hebrews is the only New Testament document that refers to the leaders of the church by the term hegumenoi. And you see that in chapter 13 in several places. Now, outside the New Testament, this designation of church leadership, this particular way of referring to church leadership, it occurs in two early Christian documents, 1 Clement and the Shepherd of Hermas, both of which are connected to Rome. 
So you say, well, that's interesting because here we have th that term being used for leaders. And then the two early documents that we have referring to them that way, they're tied to Rome. So you say, oh, it looks like there's a contact here with, uh, with Rome. And then finally, First Clement, which was written from Rome near the end of the first century, it shows familiarity and even direct reference to the book of Hebrews. Okay, so it looks, you, the earliest evidence of Hebrews in the church ties it to Rome, which makes most people think, okay, most commentators today think that's where the letter was sent. It was sent to, to Rome. Now, the date of the letter, uh, it seems pretty, uh, there's good evidence for believing that it was written before A.D. 70. You think, well, why, why think that? Because none of these things are dated. Well, it's just, again, it's detective work. The author is stressing, he's stressing the obsolescence of the old covenant and the sacrificial system in light of the new covenant that's been instituted by Christ. Now, if those sacrifices were no longer being offered in the temple, because in A.D. 70, you know, the temple was destroyed. So if those sacrifices were no longer being offered in the temple, and those sacrifices in the temple, he doesn't speak of the temple, by the way, in this letter. He speaks of the tabernacle. But the sacrifices of the temple, they were seen as being in fundamental continuity, of course, with those sacrifices that were established in the tabernacle. But given his purpose, if the temple's destroyed and we don't have the, the sacrifices being offered, it seems he would have pointed that out. It seems to fit his purpose. The fact he doesn't point it out makes you think that, okay, this looks like then it was written before. And in addition, if the sacrifices no longer were being offered... It seems unlikely that the writer would say in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, that the law covenant can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? Well, if they had stopped being offered because the temple had been destroyed, that seems to be an odd statement without at least saying something about that. But see, there are other ways. You know, you can cut this other ways. None of these things are a silver bullet where you can say it's absolutely proof positive. But it looks like there's good evidence that it was written before A.D. 70. Looks like a decent case that it was written to these recipients, a local group of people who are in Rome. Now, if the Roman destination is accurate, then, then you can reasonably narrow the date down to the mid-60s. Okay, if, 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 if it's right that it's written to Rome, you can reasonably narrow the date down to the mid-60s. You can do that because the recipients had been Christians long enough that their immaturity was unreasonable. We'll talk about that later. And they had faced and, and persevered in a time of serious persecution in the past. You see that in chapter 10. And they had yet to suffer martyrdom for their faith, but they were now uh, facing some enhanced or more extreme pressure, a severe time of trial that's coming up. Here's how Guthrie kind of summarizes this. Give me the next slide. He says, the situation indicated by the data above suggests Hebrews was written in the mid-60s A.D., just prior to the extreme persecution of the Roman church under Nero. Of course, Nero was the psychopath emperor who decided to burn Christians in Rome and light his gardens with them and this kind of thing. At this point, the Roman church had been in existence for about three decades. Now, I want you to think of this. You know, a congregation, a group of people, Christians in a city, They've been there about three decades, less time than this congregation has existed. Okay, it says, they, it says uh, uh, been in existence for about three decades. The conflict with the Jews and the government in A.D. 49, you remember they, Claudius booted uh, uh, the Jews from Rome because there was this conflict, there was instigations or disturbances over Crestus. And most people are, accept that, that, and that I think is from Suetonius, and, I, and most accept that that means that it was, a, it was a dispute about Christ. That's a defective spelling of Christus. And so they think that, that, was, that he kicked him out because the Jews and the Jewish Christians were squabbling over Christ. So he didn't like the disturbance, so he kicked the Jews out in A.D. 49. And you read about that in the book of Acts, that expulsion under Claudius. But so, so we have them, they're, they're booted out. He says, the conflict with the Jews and the government in A.D. 49, which led to the expulsion by Claudius, would account for the earlier time of testing experienced by the community. Also, Nero's rising threat to the church accounts for the fear of death and the waning of commitment indicated in Hebrews. Okay, well, if this is right, if it's written to Rome, and if it's written at this period of time, say the mid-60s, you say, well, how does that square with the composition of the church uh, in Rome at that time. You remember, of course you won't remember, but we wrote, and when Paul wrote, because uh, I taught about Romans a long time ago, but when Paul wrote Romans, probably in A.D. 57, 
Okay, and at that time, it seems pretty clear that the Roman church is predominantly Gentile, so much so that Paul takes that church within the ambit of his authority as the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, that's in 57. They're predominantly Gentile. You say, well, okay, well, here it's pretty clear that he's writing to a group of people who are in danger of, of going back to Judaism. So clearly there's this predominance of, of Jewishness there. So how did that happen? How in 57 from a predominantly Gentile group of Christians do we now go to a predominantly Jewish group of Christians? And there are a couple of possibilities. One is that Claudius died in AD 54, and after he died, like with other edicts like this, the people started to return. It simply expired on his death. So you would have had Jews uh, like Priscilla and Aquila coming back to Rome. Now, how many people, how many Jews would come back to Rome between AD 57 when he wrote Romans and mid-60s? when Hebrews were saying was written, uh, I don't know. Would that be sufficient number to change the complexion from predominantly Gentile to predominantly Jewish? Don't know, don't, don't really have a way to gauge that, but another idea, and I think this is probably more likely, is that Hebrews is written to a segment of the church in Rome, perhaps a predominantly Jewish house church or two. Because Paul mentions several house churches in Romans chapter 16. So even if you have a predominantly Gentile church overall, this can be a subset of that that is predominantly Jewish. Okay, so I think I just wanted to touch that in case you were bothered by it. Now what kind of literature is this? Well, Hebrews isn't like a typical letter. We call it a letter because the term letter is very broad. It's close enough, but there are some, some peculiarities with it. It's not typical of a first century letter in that it begins without a salutation and it doesn't name the writer or the addressees. You know, there are forms of writing letters. We have forms today, you know, dear so-and-so. Well, they had forms of letters. This one doesn't start that way. And so it seems kind of odd uh, that it doesn't have that. On the other hand, it concludes in a typical letter fashion. Okay, it has a benediction, some personal remarks, and a final farewell. So it, it kind of looks like a letter, but it, it's an odd kind of letter. Now, many are convinced that it's essentially a sermon in in written form. It's a sermon that was sent as a letter. Okay, so, I mean, that's kind of an interesting idea. It's as though the author was preaching the letter in person to the recipients. It's as though he sends this thing here and says, this, this, I'm with this. And then as it's read, he, his presence is there. Let me have the next slide. This is how William Lane, he says, the writer skillfully conveys the impression that he is present with the assembled group and is actually delivering the sermon he's prepared. Until the postscript, he studiously avoids any reference to actions like writing or reading that would tend to emphasize the distance that separates him from the group he's addressing. Instead, he stresses the actions of speaking and listening which are appropriate to persons in conversation and identifies himself with this audience in a direct way. So it's kind of interesting in terms of what type of letter do we have here, you know, that, that, that we have, uh, maybe it's a sermon that has been written and sent as a letter. And I think that may be useful uh, when we go through it. Now, the author, you've heard about the issues about the author. Though Hebrews nowhere names its author, okay? It's, it's unlike a lot of the letters. It nowhere names its author, but by the second century, the Eastern Church came to hold that Paul had written it. Okay, that conclusion was resisted in the Western Church until the latter half of the fourth century, until Jerome and Augustine then swayed opinion in the Western Church. So the Eastern Church in the second century says it's Paul's. The Western Church resists that conclusion until the latter half of the fourth century. And then from that time on until the Protestant Reformation, it was considered written by Paul. Now, at the Protestant Reformation, uh, that's when all these traditions started to be re-examined. Countless traditions were re-examined. And one of them was, did Paul write Hebrews? And virtually no scholars today would support the claim that Paul wrote Hebrews. Beyond the differences in vocabulary, Greek style, and rhetoric, the fact there's no self-identifying salutation at the beginning of the letter, it seems very odd for Paul, right? I mean, Paul's always writing and saying, you know, Paul, the apostle, Paul, this. And so all of a sudden, here we get a letter that that's not there. It just seems very odd that that would be the case. And, and then you have, uh, more importantly, is it's hard to believe that the Paul who wrote Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, would identify himself as one of those who heard the gospel, not from the Lord, but from those who heard him. 
Now, that doesn't sound like Paul at all. And he said in chapter 2, verse 3 of Hebrews. So that's what leads most people to say, no, Paul didn't write it. Okay, well, then who did write it? All right, well, we're just kind of up in the air about that. I mean, many people have been proposed as the author of Hebrews through history. But the bottom line is, is we just can't be sure. It's a he. We can be pretty sure about that because there's a masculine participle that's used in chapter 11, verse 32, that tips that off. But other than that, we can say that, look, this person was a dynamic preacher, highly educated, knowledgeable in the Old Testament and its interpretation. But who best fits that description in the early church? It's a guess. Okay, and many people have been proposed. Martin Luther, uh, he put forward the suggestion that it was Apollos. And many people think that's a quite reasonable suggestion, but you can't prove that. Okay? But that doesn't disturb me because I understand that all kinds of apostles and prophets operated in the first century. This is the, inspir this is the inspired word of God and understood to be, but we simply cannot be sure of who wrote it. Now, I wanted to give you a fictitious portrayal of the setting. This is kind of a lengthy reading, so I'm gonna have to, you're going to have to hang with me on this. But I think it's worth it, okay? This fellow, George Guthrie, in his commentary, he tries to set the background of the letter by telling a fictitious story that he thinks captures the kind of attitude and what's going on. And I liked it so much that I took it. And I edited some of it out just because it was going to be even longer than it is now. But uh, I want to read it to you. And I know it's lengthy, but just stick with me, and, and I hope it'll be useful to you. It's about a fellow, Antonius Bardavid. He says, Antonius sat alone in a deteriorating second-story apartment located in a slum on the slope of the Esquiline Hill in Rome. That morning, his employer, a rough, burly fellow named Brutus, once again turned from the task of pricing fruits and vegetables to ridicule this young Christian. Antonius cringed against the man's emotional blows, wishing he could strike back out of his hurt and embarrassment. Yet he bit his lip, nursed his wounded pride, and again asked the Lord's forgiveness for his thoughts. Persecution of the church in Rome had yet to result in martyrdom. But since the expulsion of Jews under Emperor Claudius, Christians had continued to be harassed to various degrees by both Jews and Christians, by both Jews and pagans, I'm sorry, by both Jews and pagans. Upon the expulsion, some had suffered imprisonment, beatings, and the seizure of their properties. That was almost 15 years ago now. Antonius had not been part of the Christian church at that time, but had heard about the conflict. In fact, his own grandfather, ruler of the synagogue, had been one of the most outspoken opponents of the Christians. When at 17, Antonius converted to Christianity, the old man almost died, declaring Antonius dead in a shouting match that ended in tears and a tattered relationship. In recent months, abuse of the church had escalated with the amused approval of the emperor himself, and now emotional fatigue was taking its toll. Footsteps in the hall, a scream in the night, meaningless events that never, nevertheless set Antonius' heart racing. He had been told the cost of following the Messiah, but somehow his experience was different than he expected. In the beginning, he thought his joy would never be broken, that he would always feel the presence of God. He had been taught that the Lord, the righteous judge, would vindicate his new covenant people. Did not the scriptures, speaking of the Messiah, say that God had put all things in subjection under his feet? But the church had taken a great beating lately, and members of, of its various house groups had become discouraged and were questioning whether Christ was really in control. In their hearts, they wondered if God had closed his ears against their cries for relief. Some, in their disillusionment, doubted and left the church altogether. Antonius Bar David remembered the traditions of the synagogue and the support of the Jewish community, the joy of the festivals and the solemn celebrations of the Jewish calendar. He appreciated the fellowship of Christ's community, but genuinely missed the tra traditions of his ancestors, and he missed members of his family. He watched them from some distance as they walked together to the market by the Tiber River. Some of them still would not speak to him and passed him on the street as they would a Gentile. To make matters worse, he was one of the poorer members of the church. When Antonius became a Christian, he lost his job as a tailor's apprentice in the Jewish quarter. He now spent his days sorting rotten produce, sweeping the floor, swatting flies, and receiving orders from obnoxious Roman slaves shopping for rich mistresses. To be poor and a Christian invited double portions of ridicule. Antonius had missed the weekly meal in worship for the past two weeks. 
and his heart had cooled somewhat toward the little house group. A spiritual itch in the back of his spirit warned him, cautioning him concerning his loss of perspective. Yet in recent days, he had begun to snuff such thoughts from his mind as quickly as they came. Antonius' bitterness over his current circumstances was growing and slowly obscuring the truth. That night, the believers were to meet for worship and encouragement. Rumor had it the leaders had received a document from back east somewhere. Although discouraged and tempted to skip the meeting again, Antonius' curiosity was aroused, and he decided to travel the short distance to the neighborhood house at which the fellowship was to meet. Entering the gathering room, he spoke greetings to several friends who also looked tired from the day's work. The hostess offered something to drink and friendly banter, but dejection hung like a cloud over the room. When the meal was finished, the group's leader, a good and godly man of almost 70 years, finally arrived. Joseph was a bit out of breath, having come from a meeting with the other leaders halfway across the city. He was visibly moved as he stood smiling before the group of about 20, his hands shaking slightly from advancing age. After a few words of introduction, Joseph took a deep breath and explained he had talked the other leaders into allowing his group the first reading of the scroll. With a twinkle in his eye, the elder said, I believe you will find this quite relevant. He unrolled the first part of the parchment and began reading with vigor. In the past... God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. See, this, is the, this I think, captures, and it makes it real to me. I know that was lengthy, but it makes it real to me of putting yourself in the situation and circumstance because this is part of the process of hearing what is being said. See, if we can put ourselves in that circumstance, we can appreciate more what is what the writer is doing and saying if we grasp that context. And I just thought that was a, was a good way. You just, you know, to me, I just see this person and say, well, how can somebody do that? How can, well, ask today. You know, we sit here and pull our hair out and say, what are you doing? Why are people leaving? Well, there are pressures that, that come to bear on people. And then, then it, it perks out in theology and it starts to work and say, well, is Jesus really in control and all that kind of stuff? And you have, I miss this kind of thing and I miss that kind of thing. There are all these pulls. And then there's this drift where he's, well, I'm going to stop going here and stop going there. And then you start, your conscience bothers you. Then you start squelching out, who cares, who cares, who cares? And we turn around and they're gone. We turn around and they're gone. And this is what's happening. This is what's happened since then. It happens today. And as I say, we are so concerned about it. So Hebrews, to me, is a super relevant book because we're very concerned about that. All right, the structure uh, of this structure and argument of the letter. Now, there's no consensus. Now, you read different commentators. There's no consensus on regarding the development and the, st and the structure of the argument. Different scholars outline this in different ways. By that, I mean the flow of thought. Okay, the movement of argument within the letter. You can read different people and they break it up different ways. Now, George Guthrie, his doctoral dissertation was on the structure of Hebrews. That dissertation was published as a monograph in 1994. And then he used that structure in writing his commentary, his 1998 commentary. Now, like I say, there's no consensus, but his structure has been very well received. In fact, William Lane in his commentary, he devotes an addendum uh, to Guthrie's structure. And here's what Carson and Moose say about it in their, their uh, an introduction to the New Testament. If I could have the next slide. Perhaps the most detailed and consistent outline is that of Guthrie. After surveying many other proposals, he deploys the tools of discourse analysis, text linguistics, to draw attention to the complex interplay of exposition and exhortation that runs through this document. His monograph is nuanced and allows for subtlety such as overlaps, in a later commentary, he works out his proposal in believable and practical terms. I'm going to do my best to follow that outline because I think it makes sense. Okay, now it's, it's part of the difficulty in reading it is, is, in reading Hebrews is you have exhortation or exposition about Christ. His life and his work is expounded on and then interjected in there are these exhortations. So it's like, you have this exposition being developed, then you have exhortation, exposition being developed, exhortation. Okay, so they go back and forth. And that's, that's the, the structure that I think he has discerned, not made up. I think he's, that this is an actual structure. And so that's part of what makes it difficult in reading it. Here's what Guthrie says. Uh, you know, he sees it as switching back. If I get the next slide, 
you know, this idea switches back and forth. As I say, you have this, the inter, the, these exhortation sections or hortatory sections inserting. He says, in the hortatory sections, those are the exhortation. You have exposition, exhortation, explanation, expounding on Christ. That kind of thing follows down, and then it'll be interrupted, so to speak, with this exhortation, these warnings. There are five warnings in the book, but you also have where you're just being told, listen, in light of what I just said, you need to do this. You need to do this, do this, do this, and then the exposition will pick back up. Anyway, here's what Guthrie says. In the hortatory sections, he offers powerful warnings, challenges, examples, and reminders of God's faithfulness to his promises, all based on God's word. He lays a solid foundation for his exhortation with a thorough exposition on the Son of God. The expository and hortatory sections in Hebrews overlap in the relationship of the hearers to whom God has spoken with his powerful, uh, has spoken his powerful word with the Son, of whom and to whom God has also made proclamations. Next slide. The ultimate bases for endurance, therefore, are their new covenant relationship with God's superior Son and an ongoing openness to God's word. In other words, one's endurance ultimately will depend on the health of one's relationship to Christ and faithful obedience to the word. Okay, it is these kinds of things, this basic, serious stuff, okay, that, that I think, that, five minutes, that if, you, if we are to hold people, if we are to close the back door, so to speak, we have to bring people face to face with Jesus. You see, I consider the rest of it tinkering. You know, it's just band-aids. People have to see the supremacy of Christ, the truth of Christ. And then, you know, that is, and I say, well, that's how he's going about it. That's how he's approaching it. He's calling them to say, listen, see Jesus for who he is. I understand you're being tempted to go back here. I understand this looks very good. But you need to see Jesus. You need to understand who he is and what he's done. And in light of all that, you need to get on the stick. Okay, so he'll do that, and I, and I hope that I can bring that out as we, as we go on. Now, to study, as I say, I'm going to do my best to follow uh, Guthrie's outline. Uh, if at some point I, I think it's off, I'll say it, and then I'll make a little note and tell you that. Let me have the next slide. We'll at least introduce the first. Uh, all right, chapter one. So I did get to the text. I didn't think I would. Chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Now, again, you've been in my classes. The, the uh, translation is a wooden, woodenly literal translation. I do that for certain reasons. I do it for teaching purposes. That way you can see how I'm reading this. Uh, so it doesn't always read that smoothly. But if you ever have any questions about it, why did you choose this? It would be better for you to email me, ashbycamp at cox.net, where I have access to all my stuff, and I will tell you why I did that. Okay, but uh, I do it that way uh, just because it helps me in studying, and I hope it's useful to you. You feel free to read what you're reading. Okay, I just want you to see what I'm working off of. All right, it says, Having long ago spoken to the fathers, many times and in many ways by the prophets, in these last days God spoke to us by the Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the universe who being the radiance of the glory and the exact representation of his nature and sustaining all things by the word of his power, after providing purification of the sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, having become as much greater than the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Now you talk about an opening. <laughs> you talk about an opening that's part of the reason people think this is a sermon. Because you want to lay out something about the magnificence of Jesus Christ. Well, here it is. Just laid out there and summarized in the beginning. I mean, he is the climax of divine communication. Okay? He is the climax of that. Throughout the Old Testament history, God spoke to the Israelites through various forms of prophetic communication. He used straightforward speech, but he also used parables he used allegories, he used symbolic actions, he used recounted visions. He spoke through the prophets at many different times and in many different ways, but his final ultimate revelation was given in the first century in and by his son, Jesus Christ. 
He is the crowning revelation, the ultimate revelation. We have these things being revealed in the Old Testament, and in the first century, who's on the scene? Jesus. He is the ultimate in God's revelation. He's the climax of divine communication, the one in whom the piecemeal and diverse revelations of the Old Testament come together and find their fulfillment. Okay, he is the ultimate. He is the climax of divine communication. The communication given by God in his son, he says, was given in these last days. Okay, it's given in these last days in that Jesus coming, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, and his pouring out of the spirit, that complex of events was the beginning of the last days. Okay, that complex of events was the beginning of the last days. For example, Peter in Acts 2.17, he identifies the outpouring of the Spirit as occurring in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 5 through 5, Paul describes how people will be in the last days, and then he commands, he tells, this is how they're going to be in the last days, and he commands Timothy to avoid such people. Well, he said, they're going to be this way in the last days. By the way, you keep away from them. Well, apparently they're there for Timothy to keep away from. You see, this is last days. Let me give you a... a Moose says in his, his uh, commentary on the letter to James, he says, With the death and resurrection of Jesus and pouring out of the Spirit, the last days have been inaugurated. The final age of salvation will find its climax in the return of Christ in glory. But, and here's the crucial point, the length of the age is unknown. Not even Jesus knew how long the last days would last. What this means is that the return of Christ as the next event in the salvation historical timetable is from the time of the early church to our own day near or imminent. Every generation of Christians lives or should live with the consciousness that the parousia, the return of Christ, could occur at any time and that one needs to make decisions and choose values based on that realization. So when he's saying here in Hebrews, when he says here that these, that this Communication by God and the Son was given in these last days. That's what he's talking about. Christ's coming, his crucifixion, his resurrection, ascension, and outpouring of the Spirit. That inaugurated the last days. Okay? So this is, Jesus is the climax of God's revelation. And we'll carry on from there next week. Thanks for coming.